network of uh, cities and regions here in Brussels, and we are working on sustainable mobility planning. I would like to welcome on stage the four speakers of today. So please welcome Piotr Rapatz from European Commission, Radu Andronic, city of Turda, Romania, Andreas Nordin, city of Malmo, Sweden, and Tom Cohen, UCL, London. Welcome on stage. I have a few announcements to make. All speakers will be speaking in English, I suppose. But we do have also um, interpretation. Thank you to the nice interpreters over there. We have uh, French available, number two, German, number three, and English number one on your headset. You can collect your headset outside the room. I would kindly ask all participants to switch off your mobile phone, or at least to silence them, but don't put them away because you're connected. And um, we would like to hear from you through a short set of questions that we have prepared for you. You have all found um, in your conference bag instructions to use the Connects Me app. Here's the little flyer for you. And also the people following us live stream can use the Connects Me application. So you're warmly invited to connect, download, connect me up. Feel free to, to tweet also using the EU Green Week. And if you want to enter the questions and the poll that we will be launching during this session, you have to choose the event code 2604 and find the correct session 2.4. All this information is also in your conference bag, and this is the little leaflet you will find. So I have already introduced uh, myself. I have briefly introduced the speakers. You see uh, their names on the screen, but I would like to uh, give you the floor. So who are you? We have prepared one question. The first question, please, is in which country are you working? Can we see this question on the screen, or can you enter the Connects Me app and answer this first question? Let's see if it works. I may not see the results, though. Can anybody give me feedback about these answers? Ah, oh, it's just over my head. Thank you, Madeleine. Obviously, Brussels, Sweden, Belgium. It's just one word, so if you're living in the Netherlands, just put NL, please. Anyway, we'll collect your answers throughout the session. We'll be able to share these results with you later on. We have also prepared a second question for you. We're curious to know in which area are you working? I'm an urban planner. I'm personally working in transport planning. What about you? What about the speakers? What about the nice audience we have today? And also the people watching us live Wow, very nice answers are coming in. I see a 57% in transport, nearly half of the audience, more than half of the audience, then urban development, other. I'm curious to know what these other areas are. Good. We'll see later on. Can I also have the third question, please? How would you qualify the planning policy in your city? Your answers are coming in.
Very nice, thank you. Keep on voting. But this gives me an understanding on whom we are talking to today and what is your understanding about sustainable urban mobility planning. So I saw that nearly half of you work in the transport sector, so sustainable urban mobility planning shall not be news to you. But for those of you who don't work in transport, it may be useful to explain what sustainable urban mobility planning is or what a SAMP is, because this is what we will be talking today about. A sustainable urban mobility plan is a planning concept which is applied by local and regional authorities for strategic mobility planning and is designed to satisfy the mobility needs of people and businesses in cities and their surroundings for a better quality of life. Such a plan shall encourage a shift towards more sustainable transport modes and support the integration and balanced development of all modes, walking, cycling, public transport, private cars, commercial vehicles as well, and maybe drones in the future, we don't know yet. The sustainable urban mobility planning concept and the guidelines were developed in 2013, that's five years ago. And this concept builds on existing planning practices and takes due consideration of horizontal integration across environment, uh, economic and social um, components, public participation with citizens and stakeholders, and evaluation principles. So it has a very holistic approach. Finally, as you can understand, SAMP is instrumental in solving urban transport problems and reaching local and higher level environmental, social, and economic objectives. Now that, that we know what a sustainable urban mobility plan, maybe we can see whether you, your city has a sustainable urban mobility plan. Can we have the next question? Does your city have a SAMP or an equivalent mobility plan? I give an answer for my city, my hometown, Milano, who has a good sustainable urban mobility plan. 41% said yes, 24 said no, 35% doesn't know yet. Thank you for your answers. So this session today at the Green Week aims to raise awareness about the development of more sustainable urban mobility plans across the European Union. We need more plans like this because this will lead to improved quality of life in cities by tackling those which are the main urban mobility problems in European cities, such as congestion, noise and air pollution, road safety. But also it takes into account the very important aspects of road safety and public health. If we think about the great um, public health, um, non-communicable diseases linked to the lack of physical activity. And then we know that cycling and walking can s help solve these problems. But we should not all forget the important role that freight and logistics can play. And we had uh, heard about excellent case studies where um, last mile uh, deliveries can be conducted by cargo bikes. I'm sure that some of our speakers will touch upon this point. As I said earlier, um, the SAMP guidelines, Sustainable Urban Mobility Planning guidelines, are being revised now. Last week in Nicosia, Cyprus, we had a very successful fifth edition of the European SAMP conference. It was attended, we had a record number of registered participants, nearly 800. It was an excellent opportunity for networking, for learning from each other on different SAMP experiences about evaluation approaches, financing mechanism, planning in islands and in tourism. Uh, areas about urban vehicle regulations, clean vehicles, active mobility, and much more. So now we enter the phase where these guidelines will be reviewed, and the reason for this is that a new wealth of practical experience is now available. There's additional guidance material which the um, European Commission has made available thanks to several other funded projects, and you may find in the exhibition area all this wealth of information and material available. But we also know that new mobility developments require a rethinking and extension of the current uh, guideline, such as mobility as a service, connected automated vehicles, ride hailing services. So all these aspects will be included in this exercise to revise the guidelines. I think I've spoken already too much. It's time now to give the floor 
to our panelists. We have four speakers today, two city representatives from Turda and Malmo. They will tell us more about the key challenges for sustainable mobility and how they try to overcome these challenges. The other two speakers from European Commission and University will present the EU policy framework for urban mobility, but also share some insights into urban mobility today and in the city of tomorrow. So I would like to welcome here Piotr Rapac, his team leader, urban mobility at DG Move, the Director General for Mobility and Transport at the European Commission. And I'm also happy to say that he's the contact point for cycling. He's a daily cyclist in Brussels since 2005. He's also a member of the European Cycling Group. So Piotr, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning everybody in this rainy rainy day in Brussels. Um, I hope you were you didn't get Bonjour à tous. J'espère que vous ne vous êtes pas trop mouillés en arrivant ici ce matin en cette journée pluvieuse à Bruxelles. Je vais vous parler de nos politiques de mobilité à la Commission qui nous permettent de verdir les villes. Et euh, je vais vous parler notamment de nos plans de mobilité urbaine durable, les PNUD. Donc. Tout d'abord, je vous donnerai quelques éléments de contexte sur les défis que nous rencontrons aujourd'hui. Je pense que vous les connaissez, pour la plupart en tout cas. Je vous donnerai également quelques éléments de contexte politique et ensuite quelques détails sur nos politiques. Commençons donc par ces fameux défis. Rien de nouveau sous le soleil, et je pense pour tout citoyen de l'Union européenne ou pour tout citoyen hors Union européenne, les problèmes d'embouteillage mais également de qualité de l'air sont des problèmes très courants dans les villes européennes, villes dans lesquelles les voitures sont très présentes. On commence à se rendre compte que ce modèle doit être revu. Il n'y a pas de moyen de continuer de la sorte. Quels sont les coûts des embouteillages au point de vue économique uniquement, sans parler des coûts environnementaux Eh bien, les coûts de ces embouteillages sont estimés à 110 milliards d'euros par an dans l'Union européenne. Ces embouteillages contribuent grandement au changement climatique dans l'Union européenne et ont bien sûr des effets néfastes pour la santé notamment dans les villes où euh, les voitures vont jusque dans les centres-villes. On parle souvent des particules fines et d'autres composants qui sont responsables de plus de 500 000 morts prématurées par an dans l'Union européenne. Et bien sûr, la qualité de l'air, ou plutôt la mauvaise qualité de l'air, a aussi des conséquences dévastatrices dans les pays en développement. Il faut également évoquer les questions d'espace ainsi que de ressources limitées en termes d'espace dans les villes. Et il faut réfléchir à qui dédier le peu d'espace qui reste. Quels sont nos objectifs donc et quel est le cadre politique dans lequel nous travaillons Le livre blanc qui a été adopté en 2011 se concentrait sur les transports urbains. Tout d'abord, il serait souhaitable d'utiliser moins de véhicules traditionnels d'ici à 2030 dans les villes. Il y a également des objectifs en matière de santé, euh, l'idéal serait euh, de réduire euh, à zéro toutes les morts prématurées dues à ces problématiques d'ici 2050. On a également constaté certaines difficultés concernant les véhicules qui fonctionnent avec des carburants alternatifs. En 2011, ces questions étaient assez nouvelles et aujourd'hui, euh, ces idées euh, sont de manière générale acceptées et on reconnaît que cela représente une solution. 
Notre politique est fixée dans le cadre du paquet sur la mobilité urbaine qui date de 2013. Ce paquet a permis la création des plans de mobilité urbaine durable, les PMUD, et ces plans nous permettent de nous concentrer sur des solutions multimodal où l'on combine différents types de transports à pied, en vélo, transport public, tout cela grâce à des outils numériques. Dans le cadre de ce paquet sur la mobilité urbaine, nous nous sommes engagés à renforcer le soutien financier de l'Union européenne pour la mobilité urbaine. Et nous avons augmenté de 50% les ressources dédiées à la mobilité urbaine, donc pour le cyclisme par exemple, les ressources allouées à ce domaine s'élèvent à 1,5 milliard d'euros pour l'Union européenne, pour toute l'Union européenne. Au cas où vous ne le sauriez pas, Ma commissaire Violette Abouche a déclaré que l'année 2018 était l'année de la multimodalité et je m'en réjouis puisque je suis convaincue que tout ce que nous mettons en œuvre sur les thématiques de la mobilité sont des solutions multimodales. Pour le dire simplement, la multimodalité pour moi... C'est la solution qui permet d'aller d'un point A à un point B de la manière la plus rapide et la plus pratique possible en combinant différents types de transports. Il faut également noter qu'il y a de plus en plus de solutions de partage de transports qui se mettent en place aujourd'hui. Nous nous concentrons par ailleurs de plus en plus sur la numérisation. Il y a de plus en plus d'outils qui existent pour la planification et pour prévoir ces trajets au niveau numérique et nous aimerions également utiliser ces outils pour soutenir la multimodalité. Tous les facteurs externes ne sont pas toujours pris en compte. Ce qui a pour conséquence que les trajets en voiture restent moins chers que d'autres solutions. Nous travaillons également à des propositions sur euh, des droits des passagers ainsi que sur des solutions de mobilité active qui permettent de nouvelles initiatives aussi bien pour euh, les trajets à pied que pour les trajets en vélo. Que faisons-nous dans le cadre de nos politiques pour soutenir les villes Il existe une initiative, l'initiative Civitas qui a démarré en 2002. Cette initiative permet de financer des projets qui sont mis en place dans plus de deux villes dans plus d'un État membre. C'est un projet innovant donc pour la mobilité urbaine et pour la mise en réseau des villes. Il y a euh, un forum Civitas, une grande conférence qui a lieu tous les ans, ainsi qu'un réseau Civinet qui est particulièrement apprécié par les autorités locales et les représentants des villes. Il y a également une semaine de la mobilité européenne, vous en avez probablement entendu parler. À Bruxelles, il y a une journée sans voiture, comme dans d'autres villes européennes d'ailleurs, et ça n'est là qu'un des éléments phares de cette semaine de la mobilité européenne. J'y reviendrai plus tard plus en détail. Il existe également une plateforme sur nos plans de mobilité urbaine durable sur lequel je reviendrai par la suite. Cette année, le forum Civitas a lieu en Suède. Vous êtes bien sûr tous cordialement invités. Vous vous devez d'être présent si vous voulez rencontrer des gens qui travaillent sur le terrain à des solutions de mobilité urbaine. C'est un forum qui est très apprécié par ses participants tous les ans. Quelques mots encore sur la semaine de la mobilité européenne qui a lieu tous les ans du 16 au 22 septembre. C'est l'une de nos campagnes de sensibilisation les plus connues, les plus efficaces, qui est mise en place par les villes elles-mêmes au niveau local et par les citoyens même. Donc bien sûr les programmes varient d'un état membre et d'une ville à l'autre. Toutes les villes n'ont pas mis en place une journée sans voiture. Nous en avons une à Bruxelles. Et pour moi, c'est vraiment la meilleure journée de l'année. Vous sentez la ville d'une manière très différente. 
par rapport aux 364 autres jours de l'année. L'an dernier, il y avait plus de 2526 villes qui s'étaient enregistrées pour cette semaine de la mobilité euh, européenne, et pas uniquement des villes de l'Union européenne d'ailleurs, des villes dans plus de 50 pays à travers le monde. Quels ont été les effets de la journée sans voiture l'an dernier à Bruxelles Voici des données officielles du gouvernement. Et vous voyez que la ligne rouge montre les émissions de dioxyde qui euh, sont tout simplement tombées à 0%. À partir de 6h du matin, début de la journée sans voiture, et à partir de 18h, lorsque la journée sans voiture a pris fin, ces émissions ont commencé à réaugmenter. Et les barres bleues et oranges illustrent les émissions de dioxyde lors des autres journées. Voilà donc un graphique qui permet d'illustrer euh, très clairement pourquoi la voiture constitue un problème pour la mobilité en ville. Nous avons aussi un observatoire de la mobilité urbaine, le LTIS, qui a une section euh, dédiée au plan de mobilité urbaine durable. Il y a des outils d'auto-évaluation, il fournit des lignes directrices et d'autres informations tout à fait utiles pour les villes. Et je vous invite aussi à consulter cette page, donc ltis.org. Les règlements en matière d'accès aux villes en véhicule, ces règlements ont fait l'objet d'une grande attention au niveau européen. Plusieurs villes envisagent de créer des zones à faible émission ou même d'interdire tout bonnement l'accès aux villes pour les voitures diesel. Vous pouvez bien sûr consulter ces règlements sur notre site et vous trouverez toutes les informations nécessaires Si vous prévoyez de voyager, par exemple, dans une ville qui euh, aurait été susceptible de mettre en place une telle mesure, et vous pouvez prévoir votre voyage donc dans les détails. Nous envisageons également de prendre d'autres mesures. Nous sommes en train de mener des discussions avec des États membres, puisque on s'attend à ce que la Commission prenne les devants. Les règlements en matière d'accès aux villes en voiture sont trop nombreux actuellement. Les citoyens sont perdus face à cette information diverse. On parle souvent d'un environnement législatif chaotique. Donc la Commission travaillera à simplifier les règles de matière générale. Concernant donc mon sujet principal aujourd'hui, les plans de mobilité urbaine durable, les PMUD, c'est un plan qui euh, permet de faciliter les besoins de mobilité pour les citoyens et pour les entreprises dans les villes en rendant euh, la qualité de vie meilleure pour les citoyens, en améliorant la, également la qualité de l'air. Je pense que la plupart d'entre vous connaissent déjà ce concept, ce concept, donc je ne vais pas m'attarder sur la théorie. Je vais plutôt vous expliquer comment ce concept est apparu dans l'Union européenne. Il est présent dans l'annexe 1 de notre paquet sur la mobilité urbaine qui est disponible en ligne. Et les lignes directrices sur les MUD sont également disponibles depuis décembre 2013, date à laquelle elles ont été publiées après une grande consultation des acteurs du secteur. Et je suis ravi de pouvoir vous dire que ces lignes directrices sont largement utilisées au niveau international et au niveau européen. Donc c'est un véritable succès pour l'Union européenne. Voilà euh, une infographie qui vous donne une idée du cycle de planification qui est compris dans les lignes directrices. Ce cycle comprend 11 étapes qui couvrent toutes les phases de préparation 
de mise en œuvre euh, ainsi que de fixation des objectifs euh, pour euh, ces plans de mobilité urbaine durable. Ce que vous ne voyez peut-être pas parce que c'est écrit euh, dans une police plus réduite, c'est qu'il y a également une étape d'évaluation puisque c'est un processus continu. Les villes adoptent certes un plan de mobilité urbaine durable, mais ça n'est pas tout. Régulièrement, les résultats de ce plan doivent être évalués et ce plan doit être réadapté en fonction de ces résultats. Et notamment à cause des nouvelles technologies susceptibles d'apparaître. Donc ces plans de mobilité urbaine durable visent à résoudre des problèmes tels que les embouteillages, des problèmes de sécurité routière en ville, les problèmes liés au transport urbain. Ces plans visent... Mais aussi logistique, possiblement urbain, véhicule access regulations, si la ville décide de faire ça, et d'autres areas, including aussi, par exemple, le parking management. Uh, what we are doing besides having the SUMP guidelines in place, uh, we also have a lot of planning tools. Uh, they are also Il existe de nombreux outils de planification des cadres nationaux. There on LTS.org, so you can check whether your city, if you are not sure if your city has any SUMP, you go to LTS to the city database and you can you can uh, check it for yourself and the same goes for member states profiles we are trying to encourage member states to provide a supportive framework for cities so that cities first of all are able to introduce those plans they are given appropriate uh, financial resources if possible um, other capacity building by, by uh, national level is also appreciated. So this is all included in the national frameworks on our website. We also coordinate the European platform on SUMPs, including its coordination group. It includes uh, members, people dealing with SUMP related projects, uh, and they meet two to three times per year. Uh, a nice element of the SUMP universe, let's call it like this, is an award. Uh, it's given on a yearly basis by the Commission in, in a nice ceremony in the center of Brussels, um, both by Commissioner responsible for transport and for Commission responsible for environment to, to show uh, that the impact of SUMP actually goes beyond the borders of mobility only. And you can see that six award finalists So the, the ones that uh, were chosen this year uh, were Greater Manchester, Milan, and Turda. And Turda uh, was a winner. So that was, uh, I think, um, a, a, big, a big achievement for the city of Turda, which is a relatively small city in Romania, 57,000 inhabitants, if I'm not wrong. So they have beaten Greater Manchester and Milan, big cities. This also shows that SUMP is a concept that can work for cities of all sizes, not only for big cities with a lot of resources and money, uh, but it makes sense actually to have a proper urban mobility planning for cities at, of, of each size. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, in case you have questions, I, I'll be sitting there. Thank you. Yes, in case you have questions, I think it's, it's best if I take them at the end of the session because we are running a bit late and I would like to give the floor to all our speakers and try to end by 11. I know Tom has to leave. So we heard from Piotr that the city of Turda won the Six Sustainable Irma Mobility Planning Award on the topic of shared mobility. So Turda had a clear planning vision, robust financing strategy, measurable targets. The jury noted also the replicability of the strategy and its potential to inspire other similarly sized cities. We hear Turda is a um, medium sized city of 50,000 inhabitants. The jury has also found that the level of ambition within this plan was high given the relatively small size of the city, particularly in the field of shared mobility. So we have the pleasure to have uh, here Radu, 
who will share with us his uh, knowledge about the sample world and the sample concept for City of Turda. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Radon Roni. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as uh, Piotr mentioned before, and everybody knows uh, maybe already, um, City of Turda won last year the Sample Awards, which is an annual event um, giving the award for the city, which is the most uh, inspiring example in uh, the theme that is annually chosen. Uh, last year, we had the great honor of being um, the winner of this uh, competition that is uh, European-wide. And uh, for us, it was a great achievement because um, we have not, never expected uh, uh, to um, beat uh, cities like Milan, for example. Um, so the question was uh, for today, the, my question is, uh, what is the role of the um, um, urban, sustainable urban mobility plan uh, when it comes to talk about uh, environment and the uh, quality of uh, environment in the cities? Um, so, I will use the Turda example of winning the, plan, uh, the sample words um, as a good example in terms of uh, environmental protection and the role of the plan in the environmental protection. Uh, Turda example, let's talk about a little bit about the plan. So, we are, were the sixth award winners. Uh, the plan in Turda is the first edition. Uh, it was designed and approved uh, by September last year. So it was um, a genuine uh, initiative starting from the local authorities, basically um, with the scope of uh, obtaining EU financial uh, support for infrastructure development through the European uh, uh, program of uh, regional development. Uh, some key facts about Turda, because it was uh, definitely a surprise for everybody, and most of the Europeans are asking, okay, where is Turda? Everybody knows where is Milan or uh, Manchester. Um, and, but who is Turda? We don't have a, team, a football team that is playing in Champions League. So, um, <laughs> The city of Turda is in northwest of Romania, in Transylvania. Maybe you heard about the region. Uh, it's part of the TNT network, um, European network of transport, um, being placed at the crosswords of uh, highways in Romania. It uh, has a rich and ancient history, uh, starting from the Roman Empire. And um, now uh, it's uh, most famous for its uh, salt mine, which attracts uh, more than 10 times the uh, population of the city yearly. These are some pictures. You can see uh, urban development, um, urban expansion, former industrial places, um, tr typical Transylvanian German architecture in the city center, and logistic and uh, highways that are developed uh, near the city. Uh, when we started the, the plan, as I said, we were thinking of uh, getting the EU financial support for our uh, investment projects. Uh, in Romania, the ERDF is um, used through the regional program, um, which has the key objective of reduction of the greenhouse emissions and um, reduction of the um, um, carbon dioxide emissions from the transport and from the city traffic. So uh, basically when we started uh, planning the, the actual um, project, we were starting to analyze first the uh, current situation about the environmental aspects, from, from the environmental aspects. So Turda, as every other city in, uh, in Europe or in the world, uh, almost, almost every uh, city um, has uh, just the same uh, situation, the same uh, problems when it comes to uh, environment in the urban area, which means heavy traffic in the city center, transit traffic, a lot of freight traffic, uh, which generates air pollution. I will not get to concrete figures because uh, we'll be getting boring. But also, it's about the noise generated by the traffic, it's about the heat generated by the gases, uh, it's about the heat generated by the, these oceans of concrete that we are uh, using to uh, design the pedestrian areas or the city centers. Uh, so all these kind of problems are actually taking place uh, in the same, uh, in, in Turda as, as the same. Um, about the key um, elements of the environment assessment that we were using, uh, when we were using uh, the, um, when we are developing the um, mobility plan, we were using a transport modulation software, 
uh, that could easily uh, generate for us the current situation regarding uh, emissions. So we see there uh, right now, uh, when it was planned, uh, it was the year base chosen was 2016. The situation was uh, clearly uh, regarding the emissions of carbon dioxide around uh, 32, more than 32,000 tons per year, uh, which uh, is a lot. And in the other sectors, there, are, there is the situation of what will happen with the city if uh, nothing is uh, done, or just the minimum scenario with uh, little investments. Uh, in 2013, we will have uh, 50, more than 57,000, uh, almost double, uh, the, um, some of uh, the total amount of um, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so, desperate measures uh, have to take place now. Uh, we have to uh, start working now, planning and then implementing the investment projects in order to reduce this amount of uh, emissions. Uh, when we were checking the environmental assessment, we were using these kind of indicators, but they are clearly orientative. Every city, I saw there are so many cities that, are having, uh, that you're living in and they are having already the plans. Uh, some of them, some of you don't have, but uh, your planners should use what kind of indicators they want. We were using this kind of uh, indicators: the greenhouse gases, the powders, um, noise, and uh, energy consumption for for trips generated for trips. Um, well, now we. Are at the, the Green Week uh, event, but we are talking about mobility and transport. What is the link between them? Um, the link can be the urban mobility plans, the sustainable urban mobility plan, and how to use them? Well, we were thinking that an urban mobility plan is an active tool in terms of strategic planning because it takes place uh, in a city and it uh, um, is in line with all other planning, urban planning, regional planning, national planning regulations. But it's also a functional tool because it helps us prioritize the investments, access EU funds, uh, access other kinds of funds like European uh, Investment Bank funds, EBRD and so on. But it's also in an internal operational tool because it generates um, a new um, organizational scheme, new procedures in the way that public administration is working. Uh, so in the end, the plan is not just a booklet, it's not just a strategy that you put on a shelf, it's an active tool that you are using daily. Uh, in Romania, there is a national framework um, that is um, designing the, the plans, which is a good thing. In Romania, um, um, urban mobility is uh, just a new topic, new, saying few years, starting from 2014, let's say. Um, and uh, the, the urban mobility plans are mandatory in order to access EU funds for uh, public transport and public infrastructure um, through a regional development fund. Um, they are also mandatory at the um, level of national legislation regarding uh, urban planning. And uh, one uh, key element is that uh, in the national legislation, we had already the strategic objectives of an urban mobility plan. And one of them, which is the green one, uh, is the environmental protection among the others, like safety and accessibility. So an urban mobility plan is not only about transport congestion uh, mobility, it's also about impact on the environment. And uh, also the key elements of the financial um, uh, result out of it. Uh, here is an example of uh, what, are the what were the strategies and policies that uh, the urban mobility plan of Turda was in line with. Uh, we all have on the columns um, the levels, European level, regional level, and national level. Uh, in the middle with green is the environment. So we were in line with um, the white book, for instance, of health. Uh, the White Book on Transport that Piotr was uh, talking about, uh, and also uh, we were actually in line with the European Sustainable Development Strategy, which aims to decrease the emissions of uh, carbon dioxide and also other toxic emissions. So our plan has the same goals and results in the end to uh, downcrease the level of emissions by around 16% by the end of 2030, uh, and other emissions like powders uh, to, uh, with 16% by uh, 2030 um, through the implementation of the project portfolio that uh, we have designed. Tour de Vision, uh, this is the scheme of uh, the city and what we want to achieve. Uh, basically, what we want to achieve is to have an uh, environmentally friendly city, uh, with the uh, clean and green urban areas, so don't have 
concrete oceans in the city center, capitalize on uh, its resources in its history and try to promote as an example at the uh, European and national and regional level. In the end, what we want to do is to switch from an uh, unbalanced uh, mode of transport where the car is the key element, more than half of the trips uh, generated the uh, current time, to a much more sustainable and balanced way of transport where the car would not be more than 30% by the end of uh, 2030, but also in the same time to have other sustainable uh, transport means uh, much more um, um, sustained and uh, developed. We have the five, we set up five objectives, uh, some operational objectives. One of them is uh, integrated Turda, which basically means the shift from the car-oriented infrastructure that is um, usually now in our cities to a multimodal uh, oriented infrastructure, which means to accommodate every mean of transport in the same place, but with dedicated space, which will also have an impact on safety and environmental protection. Accessible Turda um, is the expression of uh, physical accessibility between different places of the city, but it's also uh, not the least the expression of accessibility in terms of uh, social e equity. Sustainable Turda, which is much more related to environmental issues, uh, we are actually aiming for having a ec ecological public transport based on uh, electric buses and also to support other alternative um, infrastructures and alternative transport means like bike sharing, car sharing or other uh, soft measures. Attractive Turda, it's also linked to the environment because it's, it's an expression of the uh, urban environment which means that when we are designing a project for urban development, we were thinking to give life to that space, to make, make it more attractive and make it more greener, so we can attract more people and more activities in the public spaces that we're designing. So uh, it was a question, uh, what is your city planning for? And only one, uh, 11%, maybe it was one answer at that time, that the, plan, the city is planning for the, cities, uh, for the citizens and not for the cars. I think that that answer was from Sweden or something. Um, so this is what we're aiming for, to plan and uh, design places that will be for the people, not for the cars. Uh, not in the end, smart turda, which is the expression of integration of uh, new technologies and uh, smart city concepts within the infrastructure and within the projects that we're designing. Uh, at the end of uh, implementation of our pro uh, projects, um, the results of the emissions that we were um, having uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the presentation, at the beginning of the project, uh, will be less with 16% or 15% by, 20, uh, by 2030, or 9.5, uh, 7.3% less um, by uh, 2025. Well, these results are compared between the scenarios with do something uh, versus do minimum. So if you see the results in the end will be higher, we cannot uh, deny that uh, the emissions may be uh, growing, but in terms of planning, the calculation is regarding what will happen if we invest in uh, comparison with what happened if we don't do anything. Um, Another internal tool which was um, uh, very, very useful was the multi-criterial um, analysis that we were using in uh, prioritizing the projects. You can see one of, the, one of the elements, one of the criteria was the impact on the environment, the emissions of, uh, um, from the public transport. Uh, we range it 15% as importance in the total amount of uh, my project uh, score. But um, the idea was that when we were uh, giving these, uh, these numbers, when these percentages were based on a survey that was done uh, on the population regarding what is the most important for them. That's why uh, quality of life is 30% and is the maximum. Because sometimes citizens are not realizing uh, the level of pollution or the impact of the level of pollution on their lives. Uh, we stay in the traffic, we see congestion, but we don't see the gases, we don't, see, uh, we don't feel that much the heat. We say that, okay, it's summer. Um, but uh, in the end, we're not uh, conscious about what is the real impact of our lives. So, but 
we cannot uh, put less than 15%, um, but when you're planning, you can uh, switch your scores wherever, whenever you, however you want. Some examples of uh, projects for a greener city uh, that we are uh, having in our portfolio and now that we st already started to uh, implement is uh, switching to a multimodal infrastructure. This is an example of a former road that was only for cars. Um, in our project now we are designing to have bike lines, um, pavement, uh, pedestrian uh, zones, uh, but also green spaces along the road and uh, we are trying also to implement in some, uh, some ways uh, the bus lines. So the solutions that we're having in the projects are not uh, magical and not uh, ex extraordinary. It's just normal solutions that can be applied in every city. As Pro uh, Piotr said, Turda example can be applied in any other city in, uh, in Europe and this is the magic of, uh, of this uh, award. Uh, other project uh, is the alternative transport, for example, the bike sharing system that we are now implementing in Turda uh, with um, several bike uh, renting stations automized. That will be also linked with uh, public transport through a one-way ticket. Um, other soft measures that we're imp uh, now uh, putting in place, it's um, implementing a parking policy that will discourage the traffic uh, and parking in the city center, uh, make it much more expensive and uh, try to reduce the length of the parking time in the city center. Um, also supporting through a carpooling app, which means that uh, we will um, support people to leave their uh, cars back home and drive together to the city center or uh, other uh, areas of interest. Um, electric uh, public transport, we have already launched the public tender for buying the electric buses. Uh, Turda will be the first city in Romania with a fully uh, electric uh, bus fleet. Um, it will be 4th of June, the deadline for um, offers. Uh, this morning I uh, found out that it will be a sh short delay of four days, so it will be 8th of June. Um, it's part of this investment project that will be financed through ERDF uh, financial mechanism. Uh, we expect to sign uh, mid of June the financing contracts from, for the first package of 31 million euro, out of which 98% will be uh, support of the European Union. And uh, that's it. I will be available for all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Radu. Perfect. On time. I was about to stop you, but you closed on time. So, excellent. What if you were the next winner of the SAMP award? Well, the call is open. Topic is multimodality. You may found, you will for sure find more information out there in the ex exhibition area or just by logging in the European um, Mobility Week website online. The call for actions is also open for the European Mobility Week. So register your city, register your action. 25 cities and 673 actions have already been registered. We are waiting to receive your actions. So hurry up. The next speaker is um, Andreas, Nordin city of Malmo. Malmo was an, another winner of the fourth sample award in 2016. And Andreas will be here to, telling, to tell us more about the experience in Sweden. All right, hello. Uh, it's my Presentation. Okay. Uh, yes, that's me. Uh, so I'm I'm from uh, the city of Malmo, and I'm just going to show a little bit about this, uh, what we've, uh, what kind of experience, and uh, what the best parts that we have uh, from our SUMP, best experiences. So uh, just to show you where Malmo is, it's in the south of Sweden, uh, north of Europe, I guess you could say. Uh, and we, we've done a short history of Malmö is that we've done a, a, a journey from an industrial city to a city of knowledge. And, uh, and uh, we have these big investments lately done in the, the, the bridge between Malmö and Copenhagen, the Danish capital just across the, the water. And we've done a tunnel under the city so the trains can easily pass through and we've implemented a new uh, BRT system. 
And I should mention that Malmö is a city of 320,000 inhabitants. Uh, so you get the scale. So, and yeah, you can see it here. Then the population has really I increased uh, in the, in the, since the 80s. We had a big dip in the big industries. We had a big shipyard. Uh, it was uh, uh, out of uh, practice. And then, but now with this new trend, you are, uh, uh, this uh, information city, we have a lot of people moving to Malmö every year. And uh, we have a, have a good trend also, if you look at the last couple of years, uh, it's, um, you can see that, that it's all uh, compared to the level in 2007. You can see that the population is the, the dotted line. So you can see the population is steadily increasing, but uh, uh, the, all the sustainable means of travel have actually increased a lot, but, uh, but uh, the car share has decreased. And we need to keep this going. We see the a trend that, uh, that this is uh, becoming less and less, and actually the car share is actually increasing a little bit. So we need to work harder. And we, we do this uh, every five years. We do a big uh, travel survey, and then we, so we get uh, where, where, where are we and where do we want to go. So we see that uh, we've done a, a, this big, we've taken all the easy measures and uh, taken, uh, done them, the, the low-hanging fruits, so to speak. So we reduced the car traffic from 52 the car share, I should say, from 52% and to 40%. But uh, the tricky part with this kind of service is that people, uh, they don't uh, really, uh, they have a hard time uh, to define their uh, pedestrian trips. So this is how many pedestrian trips do you do? Uh, yeah, so we get a big difference from year to year from a big different service. But I'll, I'll come back to this uh, survey in a couple of slides. So the, 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 the problems we now, or the, the challenges we're now facing is we have a big uh, growth in the region and the city. And we had, uh, when we, we did the SUMP, the SUMP, we had a new uh, city land use plan. So, and uh, we ha also have a lot of problems with, as mentioned before, so I think a, bit, a lot of cities have these uh, uh, problems with the external effects. And we need to, we also wanted to include all aspects of sustainability and make a holistic approach on this. So this is uh, just a schematic uh, showing where we see our, uh, in the middle you see the sustainable urban mobility plan. And the, the trick here was that we needed some way to, to uh, connect the, the, the line between the comprehensive plan, the, the big scales for, for the city, and then the, the, you know, the programs for the bicycle and the and, uh, pedestrians and, and the traffic, uh, freight traffic and everything. It's really, it's really detailed, so it's really hard to connect the dots with, between the, these uh, detailed programs and the comprehensive plan. That's why we needed the, uh, the sustainable mobility plan, and it's like sort of a translator. How do you translate this work into the, with, to each other? And this is just to show you the, all the, the challenges uh, we have. The air quality, the we want to get rid of all the red air qualities, and preferably the orange as well. And uh, the noise pollution, it's really, uh, it's really bad in some parts of the city. So this, this uh, is why it's so important to keep, keep this uh, up. And this, this is also something I think you should emphasize when doing the, the uh, social, uh, sustainable mobility plan. Because we have working uh, a lot with the economical uh, sustainability uh, during, uh, during the years, but uh, then only maybe 20 years we've been working for the, with the environmental uh, sustainability and only the last couple of years we've been working with the social sustainability sustainability because it's really important how you connect how how where can you work who lives in what parts of the city how is the city uh, constructed so and uh, who can because a car is not for everybody you need a driver's license and you need to own a vehicle and it's expensive and so on so should we uh, preserve uh, parking spaces in the in the center of city for a small fee. It, it's it's not the uh, 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 equal way to to uh, divide the city. So this all this uh, should be uh, uh, taken into account when when thinking about these sustainable urban mobility plans. And the one 
really important step for us was to get the politicians and everybody in charge to agree on the vision. This is the vision for Malmö. The, the, we said that we need walking, cycling and public transport to be the first choice for all who work, live or visit Malmö. So, so this and, and also the, the goal uh, that we, we set early uh, for, uh, for car traffic. Was, this was the, uh, made us able to, to work efficiently with the plan. So, and you can see here, this is uh, the, the, the goal for uh, 2030 is uh, that we have a 30% car share. So actually it's the same as in Romania. So, and, uh, and, but with the current growth of the city, we, we, the height of the pillar, uh, they show the, the amount of trips. So you, you, or you see the amount of inhabitants times the amount of the share. So, and you can see that actually the share, the amount of trips, car trips, 40% car trips today is the same as 30% car trips in 2030. So we have a big challenge here. We need to increase all the other modes of transportation, decrease the, the, car, uh, the share of car trips, but we still end up with the same amount of car trips. So... Uh, that's a tough, uh, tough deal, but uh, we, I th we will make it work. I'm sure it. <laughs> but so, so, and and because I'm talking about a lot of the, about traffic and uh, the streets and uh, the cars, but we, it's really important when you talk about this that the car and uh, the streets are not used for uh, for just for traffic. We just yes, to show uh, the, uh, the the planners everywhere that we, we are not uh, single-minded thinking about traffic. This is how you use the uh, streets in Malmö. I think all cities have the same, of course. You use it for, you know, you have the, the trees, the, the, the lighting, the water management, the, the information, the art, the benches, the restaurants. Uh, yeah, Every, all this. And also, of course, the traffic and the, the parking spaces and the bicycles and everything. It's important to remember when you're talking about traffic planning, and mobility plans. This is all, you have to think about all this. And maybe even add the contents of the housing because they, they matter, on the, they spill over into the street and they matter how you use the street. It depends on how, what, what's inside the housing. And uh, so it's important to make an efficient choice. So we borrowed this from the Norwegian uh, transport Institute and uh, below the, the green line, you can see the, the area used for every uh, mean of transportation. So you see that the, 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 um, the most efficient mean here is, is uh, obviously walking, but you can see also that the car uses a lot of uh, space because it has a, a lot of driving space, but of course also the parking space. Uh, so the theory, theoretical example here would be that you, if you take uh, one people uh, commuting by car and make them travel by, by bus, you would save 20 square meters of, uh, of the city available for something else like restaurants or parking or, or parks, I mean, <laughs> not parking. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, the bike share, uh, bike it doesn't look so good, but it, you, the bike have other benefits with um, the health benefits and so on. So we, we focus a lot on biking as well, despite this area usage. And one thing, other thing we had a really big uh, usage of was that we had the goals for the entire city. It's a very big goal and, and it's very good for the, the strategic planners. But then you come to the, the, uh, the planning for housing projects or specific plans, small detail plans. Then we need uh, the goals for, for different parts, different goals for different parts of the city. In the, the number one in this map is the city center. And so we can't have the same goals for the city center as we have for area like 14 or 15. So we have completely different goals. So we can allow a lot more travel by cars and we cannot provide the same level, of course, not to provide the same level of uh, public transport for, for the, the areas 14, 15 and so on. So this is really helpful when it comes to hands-on planning and these this goals can be used by anyone and understand, understood by the constructors and, and all those uh, people we cooperate with building the city. And uh, this is also something we have uh, a lot of use
from. We have the yeah, European inspiration and innovation. Currently, we're working in the, in the Sums Up uh, project in Civitas, and we are doing three, three uh, innovation, innovations. And uh, you know, I said earlier that the travel app, it's dependent on how people, uh, or the travel survey is different how people uh, answer on how they interpret it. But now we're doing it uh, with an app parallel to the normal, uh, like the traditional survey. So, uh, so this is going to be interesting, see how they compare. Being done this year, result early next year, I think. Uh, and, and then we're doing a poly SUMP, which is involving the uh, uh, 11 uh, communities around Malmö and uh, making a, a SUMP together, or trying, I should say. We haven't made this. We're trying. It's a lot of uh, decision making to be done, but it's, uh, it's looking interesting. And then we're making a computer model that we do it goal oriented in, instead of the traditional way, uh, or at least we had the traditional way of predicting and providing. Now we try to set the goal and what do we need to do according to the model to achieve those goals. So it's interesting. And then we have the ICLE, uh, um, we're a member of the uh, ICLE network, and we, so it's really good for, for sharing like this or, or uh, uh, learning from others. Uh, and so another thing we have been successful with is mobility management it's a cheap uh, cheap way to make a big difference in a short period of time but you have to repeat it every couple of years this mobility management uh, project yeah so we, we we cut a lot of the short car trips uh, disappeared and then we have uh, of course the dialogue with the, the citizens and y using the SUMP and the goals generated there we ask them uh, how do you want uh, your part of the city or, or the, the city center uh, to, to uh, transform or do you want to transform it and we see that yes it's a big uh, big if you actually ask the, the people uh, living in the city they have a lot of uh, they, they really uh, want to improve the, the, the city life aspects and only 18% want to increase the car uh, space for cars and it's really hard to do so we're not going <coughs> to do that but, uh, <laughs> but so it's good you can get a, a lot of uh, f positive feedback from the uh, citizens so and they also told us we need uh, better parking houses they look they look like crap so okay so this is uh, we thought this is nice yeah this was in, it was next to a park, so it's good. Put a lot of effort into parking houses. And then we let streets like this, we didn't, hadn't, hadn't done any work for a lot of years. And they say oh, it's unsafe and people drive too fast. And it's, uh, so we cleaned it up uh, from all these little bushes and everything and put a biking lane. And it's, it's not the biggest measures, but it's, uh, it matters a lot. Then we could do a little bit bigger measures. We had a square that was really inaccessible. And uh, then we transformed it, ma making it uh, the bike route uh, go uh, across it and make the, the people that wanted to uh, use it was like uh, skaters was one group of uh, people. And, they want, and we say, OK, fine, you can use it. And it's a much, more, uh, much better used place of the city. It's used. It, it, it was abandoned before. And uh, we added a bus uh, stop as well. And uh, this street was actually in the, as Piotr mentioned, um, the mobility uh, week. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we actually mm -hmm. took this street and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, tried some measures. On, and then we, they, we permanent, they made, uh, made them permanent. And 98% of the inhabitants on the street said, this is excellent. <laughs> we love it. And we, did, uh, like, we tried everything, crazy stuff, like ping pong tables and stuff like that. But, uh, and, it, and it's working. No one is stealing the... Uh, everybody loves it. So it's uh, great to have these innovations. Yeah, just to sum up, I, I think that it's really important you make the, the SUMP for all planners. It's not a traffic plan. It's a, it's a plan for everybody, like the, the general plan. And you should include all the aspects of sustainability. And also, it's really important that you measure, follow up, uh, and allocate resources for implementation. Because uh, otherwise, it's, uh, as we've, it's, it's a risk that it just becomes something you put in the bookshelf. Yeah, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Outstanding images, wonderful. From a plan to implementation, we have seen it all. Our last speaker is uh, Tom Cohen, Centre for Transport Study, University College London. Tom is interested in all aspects of transport, but is particularly interested in citizen participation in the planning of transport. And this is connected with interest in policy decision making and policy implementation. Well, Tom, if I go back to one of the first questions, the audience, nearly 70% of cities in the audience said uh, that their cities are planning for city life, place making, cycling, walking, and car restraint. So maybe my question for you when you come up here to speak is, do you think we can say there's a shift to a new stage in uh, transport planning in cities? And what more can we expect from the future? I think that your experience in the CREATE project can tell us more as well as your uh, research work. So Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Florinda, and good morning, everyone. That question is what is known in the trade as a plant, as you will see. The question that you opposed in the interactive session before we started uh, was, I think, informed by the CREATE project, where three different paradigms of transport and city planning were presented to you, planning for the car, and as we put it, planning for urban mobility, and finally, planning for the city of places. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail. But um, I ought to explain that I'm here moonlighting from CREATE's final conference taking place across town in a marginally more accessible venue. And I, too, have a tale of woe concerning my journey here, which involved a bus that was uh, diverted without announcement and took me on a very interesting tour of parts of Brussels I've never visited. But I made it, and I'm sorry, I'm part of the reason that we started late. So the CREATE project in a sentence, I could give you the blurb, but I think that summarizes it quite well. We're trying to understand how cities and their transport have interacted over time, and my part of the project, leading a work package called Future Developments, is to try to look into the, the future and to ask where we go next. And the car is a very fundamental part of the CREATE project, but as I will go on to explain, I think its importance might recede. So, as I said, we were presented with three paradigms in those questions, and this slide sets out quite neatly the three ways in which cities have tended to do transport in lots of places around the world. So they start out with a belief that the car is a good thing, there is a growth in car ownership, so they start building for the car, and surprise, surprise, car use goes up. And then the city realizes that there are some problems associated with that, and this is in the past before we knew about things like dying through air pollution and climate change hadn't been invented, but we did at least recognize congestion when we saw it, and we realized it was a good idea to get people to start traveling by high capacity mass transit. So that was where we developed the idea of the sustainable mobility city. And then we pause and we realize that that's all well and good, but we're still preoccupied with movement. That in fact, we've forgotten whether the city is functioning as a place. And that's where we move into what we call stage three, the city of places. And this city, I think, is arguably an example. And we have five so-called stage three cities that have been part of the CREATE project. We also have five so-called stage one cities that are probably more grappling with the role of the car and trying to work out how they can possibly short circuit the process that many of these other cities have been through because it takes decades and it's rather unpleasant. Here are some of the measures that you would expect to see in those three categories of cities and I won't go through them. No doubt you will have access to the slides. And as I've said, it's quite common for cities to go through a trajectory where car use grows in tandem with the stage one. It peaks as better facilities for mass transit are provided and then begins to tail away as the city of places takes precedent. It's a very simple model, but it's one which really does seem to resonate with a lot of people. So we could have a debate about whether your city has started at stage one or started at stage two. London, for example, built its underground system before we had cars. At that point, we had not Karmageddon, Karmageddon but Horsemageddon. But it's the same idea. You had to do something to deal with the, the quantity of transport that was not using space very efficiently. But, as I say, my role in the project has been to ask about the future, and in particular, this mythical concept of stage four. And my job has been to try to come up with an interpretation of what stage four might be. And I ought to say before I go on that we could attempt to predict it, 
but I think that that's probably a fool's game. So my version of stage four, as I'm going to present here, is the stage four that I think we probably want. But of course I'm being provocative because I come from a university and I don't have to live with reality. And also, um, hopefully because uh, there are things about it which aren't quite right and which we need to finesse. But anyway, here are some descriptions for stage four as I would put it to you. The first is that I think it will be post-modal, and I'll explain in a moment what I mean by that. I also think it will be journey rational, and this isn't a new idea, but we have been talking for a long time about trying to reduce the need to travel, to remove certain trips that aren't necessary, perhaps, as I'll go on to say, through clever technology, but also through better planning, cross-sector governance, and so on. We can also improve on resource efficiency, and we saw with the example of Malmö that some forms of transport use up more of the network than they need to. And finally, and this is a very important point, balance. And I'll just say a moment, I'll say a word or two about that now. So there's balance in the sense of social justice, in that even the most advanced cities still have a great deal of disparity amongst their citizens. Some of them get to travel quickly and comfortably and pleasantly, and others don't. Some of them don't experience most of the nasty effects of everybody else's travel, but if you live beside a busy road, you'll know all about it. And there is a strong disparity, as I say, a, a wide dispersion of people's experiences of transport, and the stage four city is actually going to tackle that head on. So it won't just be the warm words which we tend to see in our documentation, it will actually be measures that tackle injustice. The other kind of balance which I think it's worth pointing out is that the three stages I've presented to you thus far are actually in tension. And we need to confront this. If we talk of a city of places, that's all well and good, but we still need actually to cater to movement. These two things are competing for the resources of our cities, and we need to find the right balance between them in order for our cities to flourish. It's pointless to talk about pedestrianizing an entire city. It's not going to work. So this is an image which I feel sure most of you have seen, and I shall be very disappointed if you haven't, but I'm about to be rude about it. On the left-hand side, there's the evil car. And lots of people driving their cars, one per vehicle, look how much road space they take up. That same number of people put in a bus, that's the middle image, isn't that wonderful? And so this has been the orthodoxy for a very long time. Uh, what I'm going to suggest to you is that post-modal means in part having to move on from this rather limited way of thinking. Because with advancing technology and the sharing economy, and possibly clever governmental interventions, there's no real need for cars to have only one, people in, one person in them. Cars could have all their seats filled. So that's one thing. Another thing is that cars might become uh, greener. They're already going that way. In bus land, now I know that we like to fantasize about buses that are full all the way from the start to the end of their route, <laughs> but in reality, and what if that bus is powered by dirty diesel, you know? That, that fuel which has suddenly become terribly unfashionable, but which actually powers most of our heavy moving vehicles. So I put it to you that the presumptions behind this rule, car bad, bus good, we'll talk about bicycles in a moment, are probably going to change. And so going back to our stages, stages one, two, and three, the, the car was perceived as good in stage one, and there are plenty of cities that still are building for the car and think of the car as being part of the solution, maybe the whole solution. We get to stage two and we realize that there are some problems with extensive car use, so it's beginning to get less good, it's kind of moving towards evil. By stage three, we actively hate the car, don't we? It's a thoroughly bad thing. Well, I'm suggesting that by stage four, we'll have become zen about the car. We're at peace with it, and that's because it's no longer evil, it's simply one of the modes. And if it happens to be used very effectively, and if the negative externalities are minimized, then there are going to be lots of cases where it is actually the appropriate way of making a journey. Heretical thing to say at a Green Week summit, I know, but I'm prepared to be daring. And what I mean by this is that our preoccupation with mode is, in my opinion, a little bit myopic. And in due course, we begin to think that it's not about mode, but it's actually about the resources that we're using when we travel, and the way we travel. It's not the kind of contraption that we're in, the shape of the box. Um, active travel, I think, is a special case, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So how does this interact with technology? Very briefly, post-modal transport is going to be informed by the fact that we're having a shift in the energy uh, system providing our transport, that 
bottom left, we're going to see more and more shared transport, which does imply possibly smarter use of facilities, higher vehicle occupancy, less storage of vehicles blocking up our streets. Top left, mobility as a service seems to me to be a really good paradigm case of how modes are beginning to blur into each other. I mean, what is really the difference between public and private now? What is the difference between individual movement and collective movement? They're actually beginning to become nearly indistinguishable. And then the bottom right is just a, a reminder that the minibus, so often something of a, a joke, I suppose, is being rediscovered in any number of high-income cities as being part of the solution. The 12-seater. Journey rational. So we're going to be able to reduce the extent to which we travel and this is going to be facilitated by a variety of things. Virtual presence, top left. 3D printing, additive printing if you prefer, bottom left. Um, top right, teleservices making it possible to do things remotely more and more. And then automation as represented by my um, dishwasher filling robot there. More things which might be able to happen without a journey being necessary. Whether it will really happen, well, that's another matter. And then resource efficiency, again, we've seen the change in the energy system. Sharing also mean that, means that we can use our highway and other transport networks more efficiently. Mobility as a service promises some of the same. And then bottom right is just a humble tidal flow lane. We've had them for years. But this kind of intervention, it's going to get cleverer, it's going to get slicker. We will be able to use our network more dynamically so that it responds to demand and we can squeeze more out of the system. Now, I haven't talked about automated vehicles, have I? Which, of course, is another heresy. But I would say that the interesting thing about AVs is that they're not actually essential to stage four. Quite the opposite, in fact. They could take us in the wrong direction. So I would just invite you to be as circumspect as I try to be concerning AVs. They may be good. They may not be. And here is some evidence. A hype cycle which demonstrates that AVs are right at the peak in an area known as peak of inflated expectations. So we need to be aware of how we might be a little bit too keen on this technology. I predict that these are probably going to go out of fashion. This chap, who is it? You don't have to vote on your keypads. You can use your mouths if you wish. Travis Kalanick, founder of Uber. And I simply put that picture up because the likes of Uber are going to become increasingly important in stage four. Disruptive, audacious, powerful third parties making it more interesting for cities to manage transport than used to be the case. And in part because they'll be able to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to campaign on their behalf when things don't go their way. I need to finish. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. And also, my sincere apologies, I know that you want to go for coffee anyway, but had you wished to ask me a question, you can't because I have to leave. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Tom. But the other speakers can stay five more minutes, and I hope the audience can stay five more minutes. Um, I would like to interact with you uh, a little more. If you could take your tablets, iPads, Devices, we have two more questions that I would like you to answer before we take questions from the floor. Can we have the next question, please? Which should be, which are the main factors to ensure sustainable urban mobility solutions in your cities? Answers are coming in. We see mobility planning, political support, funding and public acceptance. So good mobility planning, tools for mobility planning together with political support seems to be the most requested uh, factors which would, would ensure sustainable urban mobility solutions in your cities. Good. Now what about the last question, please? How can decision makers be convinced to opt for a sump in your city? 
quite a critical question, isn't it? Is there any decision makers among you? Well, I don't know. Do you think that uh, it's a top-down approach? We need national frameworks for SAMS. We saw that uh, Sweden and Romania do have some frameworks at the national level. Does that help? Or you think it's more of a bottom-up approach? You need advocacy groups and stakeholders pressure to get this political support. What's your opinion? It's not easy. Maybe the right answer is in the middle. Well, we have the needle moving more on, on the right side, bottom up. We need advocacy groups, stakeholder pressure, most likely citizens' involvement in uh, ensuring that uh, sustainable urban mobility is uh, high up on, on a city's agenda. Good. I think this uh, little interactive session was good, but I still would like to hear from you. Is there any of you who has a burning question at the end of this long session? Yes, I see immediately here a lady on the second row. I have to read out a short statement. So if you want to speak, it will be assumed that you have agreed that your picture and comments will be webcast. That's Please. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Maya Hannesson from the El MacArthur Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for some really interesting presentations. I took loads of notes. Um, I think my main burning question around these uh, sustainable mobility plans is how much in practice um, are these like are the executions and the planning process integrated with other policy areas? So for example, Land use planning is incredibly important uh, to reduce the need for transport. Energy planning is really important to produce the right type of energy to actually have sustainable mobility if you're electrifying it and so on. So I'm thinking, yeah, both in this, at the city level, like do you work across departments at the EU level? Do you work across the, the commissions? Like how much, how much are there integration in practice? Good, I think this is a question that uh, Andreas can s try to answer and then we'll ask also to Radu. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's super important to have uh, the connections across the partners. I work for the streets and parks department, and uh, but actually the, the main owners now, I would say, of the SUMP is the city, what do you call city building office. Like the, the ones that have the 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 make the the plan housing plans because we made made it so easy and usable for for them to so it's uh, they they are the main sp spokespersons for for the for the SUMP but we of course we still use it but we are more uh, uh, otherwise more in in detail with how are we planning the bike network and so on and so forth so Make it uh, easy enough to use for, and, and of course include everyone while making the plans, all, all the departments of the city. On the EU level, I don't know, if, uh, I think someone else is better suited. Uh, yeah, so, so yes, of course the integrated, integrated approach is, uh, is the, the approach that we pursue. Um, and with the upcoming revision of the SUMP guidelines that should um, happen by the next SUMP conference, so let's say by mid next year, we would like to further strengthen this integration with other areas uh, aspect, uh, including um, land planning, but also energy infrastructure, for example. Uh, this is in especially important when, uh, when we realize that the electric vehicles are behind the corner or are just arriving already there, already on our streets. So, so this is crucial and for sure we will focus it. However, we still have to bear in mind that the SUMP guidelines at EU level are rather general and then it's up to cities, of course, to implement it in a proper way. So I give microphone to Radu to say some more words. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for the question. Uh, I put in the presentation also the um, uh, list of policies and um, strategies at national, regional, and uh, European level that the plan is in line with, For in the, in the example of Turda. But actually, we are working like this for all the projects that we are uh, doing uh, right now, because in the end of the plan, you will uh, receive a portfolio of in real investments. So you have to be sure that these investments are a result of uh, inline thinking with all the other strategies, and they are literally multi-sectoral uh, and totally different from sociological point of view, health, uh, education, transport, urban planning, uh, urban uh, land use. Um, so uh, you definitely need to cover all of these. So it, it requires a team of experts from different, uh, different sectors. So what we have done uh, in the planning part was to take all of these uh, strategies and policies and European regulations, put them in line, read them carefully, what are the objectives and results, goals, uh, or even quite concrete projects. For example, in European policies there you will not find projects, but in uh, regional uh, development strategies you can find also a list of projects. So the projects that we were in the end uh, trying to plan to be, uh, it was mandatory, not mandatory, but it was very good to be in line with, uh, with this regulation. Which means uh, we were also using uh, this uh, moment of correcting some of the projects or uh, in interventions or investments that were planned, I don't know, five years ago, ten years ago, uh, which are now obsolete, so we don't need them anymore. For example, like a bypass, because now we have a new highway around the city, so we don't need the, that specific bypass. Uh, that was part of the urban general urban plan. Uh, it's not in the, in the mobility plan. This is like a concrete answer. So, um, then on the other side, we put all the projects that we were designing, the investments uh, that were coming up a solution for, the, for our problems, uh, and we were linking uh, the project list with uh, specific goals from each strategy. So in this way, we could be sure that they are in line with, uh, with the goal, general goals uh, in different sectors and in different levels. Thank you, Radu. I wish I could take more questions, but I I know you deserve a coffee, tea, and a break. So I think uh, it's time to close this session. I would like to thank the speakers, my four Mosqueteers today, Radu, Piotr, Andreas, and Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience as well. You've been fantastic. Uh, on behalf, thank you on behalf of the Directorate General for Environment of the European Commission. Uh, when you leave the room, please return the headset and the receivers to the um, to the persons outside the, the room. Don't forget to fill out the survey before you leave uh, or uh, do it online. Uh, that would be helpful for the organizers. And last but not least, uh, uh, it's a reminder, there's a tools room here somewhere in the venue where you can try for yourselves some uh, uh, tools and platforms that exist to help cities develop in a sustainable way. So. Come along and try them. They are on the ground floor in the Dorving room near the Newton room. It's very scientific. Uh, thank you again. I wish you a good day and thanks for coming along. Bye bye also to the web uh, online streaming uh, viewers. Ciao, ciao. Thank you to the interpreters.